Welcome to the number one MSU basketball podcast in America. The final four is not on the schedule. Join Rod and me, Eric, as we dive deep into the Spartans to get you prepared for every game. Subscribe today for in-depth recruiting updates and fantastic interviews with today's important college basketball personalities like Robbie Hummel. Thank you for having me. I uh, I have listened to your guys' podcasts numerous times on drives throughout any Midwestern Big Ten city, so I, I am big fans of your guys' work. Jay Billis. And next time, hey, if anybody in Michigan wants a December tea time, call me. You wimps won't show up, but I'll I'll be there. I'll be there and play in the cold. And Izzo will be in front of the fire with hot chocolate. Coaches Thomas Kelly. Oh, no problem. Glad to be back, man. Glad to be back. Mike Garland. You just can't sit there and trade twos for threes. You can't do it. You're going to lose. Coming down the stretch, you're going to lose. And more. You won't find better coverage of Spartan Hoops than you will get here. For both the casual and hardcore fan, come along as we take you for a green and white ride. Hey everybody, it's Eric alongside Rod here, and we're happy to review Michigan State's exhibition game against Tennessee, where they lost a nail-biter, 89-88, on a free throw. (laughs) So, before we start the show, we'd like to thank all the new listeners to the show. The numbers for the show have really exploded, Uh, so welcome to the Best MSU Basketball Podcast. Be sure you subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Continue to share the show with your friends, family, other Spartan fans. You won't find a better pre- and post-game analysis for MSU Hoops than right here, a uh, big thank you to Keith Kramer, Kenneth Kramer, who left us a gift via PayPal. If you love and value what Rod and I are doing, please consider leaving a one-time gift via PayPal or Venmo, or recurring monthly gift via Patreon or Substack. The support means a ton to us and helps us run and promote the show to reach even more fans. You can find links to do that over on our website at tffinots.com slash support. You can also find ways of buying a logo hoodies and t-shirts at tffinots.com slash Merchandise. Okay, Rod, so let's discuss the game. But before we talk about the game itself, I, I was at the game, so I did not hear. What was, did they met, make any mention of Bill Rafferty and Connor Onion working the game together? Oh, oh they had props. <laughs> yes. Yes. It was mentioned. <laughs> uh, so, an unusual game. I mean, obviously, it's exhibition. There are strange rules that they did not, you know, at least. The people in the arena had no idea when uh, Meshach got right. his fifth well, foul. We heard them, right? <laughs> or sixth foul, or right. seventh foul, or his eighth foul. <laughs> right. He almost fouled out twice. That was the that was the one. Yeah, that was the one big thing. I do wonder if it had gone to overtime, if they would, if they would have played it, if they would have played it. I don't know. Yeah. It, well, it's not. It's not clear. And my wife turned to me. And she's like, "Are they?" play overtime I'm like i think they would because i know other games have but i think you know coaches just make up their own rules what how they want to work it and so yeah it would have been a hell of a thing and, and probably justified if it had been called a tie yeah right um, i think so but uh <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll get into why i i think the one thing we come up with that game is that these are two really good teams uh you know i think yes the, i agree with that we talked about tennessee and the one thing that tennessee was really deficient in last season was scoring and they're two transfers in boy yeah. we <laughs> wondering if the guys at the uh mid, i don't even think they're i guess you call it mid majors but they're almost like low mid majors but they uh they definitely yeah. delivered both both connect and uh gainey so um 49 points yeah, combined I mean, they were between the two of them yeah it was look here very simple statement i said in our preview that i think tennessee deserves to be the preseason favorite in the sec no question uh that performance minus two starters uh does not dissuade me <laughs> from thinking that and and i will say this if they get anywhere remotely close and they won't but if they get anywhere remotely close to that kind of perimeter shooting and i say they won't they shot 52 percent, yeah. i believe from three on the game they're not going to do that over the season no matter how good these two guys are but if they can be like a high 30s team from three, they they are going to be extremely difficult to beat because they have most of the other elements you need. I mean, we saw, especially in that first five minutes, where they just delivered roundhouse after roundhouse to Michigan State. You see what the caliber of defense is, the, the, the toughness that they play with. They really are 
they are an old time Big Ten team. Mm -hmm. Yep. They are a Big Ten team the way that I remember, you know, vintage Izzo teams, uh, Gene Cady's great Purdue teams. They are that. And you put that together with that kind of defense and the size they have, they are, I'm sure this was visible to you. And we'll talk about this too, that they are a big team. Oh yeah. Very big. I mean, they're not like, you know, rolling out five, seven footers, but they're just big everywhere. Yeah. And you put all that together and add in consistent jump shooting. Yeah. That's a tough team. So, that to me, the caliber of that game was honest to God. It was every bit as good as, you know, people always talk this time of year and, and you can, you can file it under the cliche category. <laughs> oh, this is a second weekend in March level game. And sometimes it actually is true. There, there's been the occasional game, say at a Maui or a, um, mm -hmm. uh, Atlantis, you know, those tournaments where you see two top 10 teams going at it and it's a really competitive, well-played game. And you think, yeah, that's, you know, th this is what you would expect to see from a really high caliber sweet 16 elite eight, even final four type game. That game today was that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, those teams wanted it badly. I think both coaches coached it. We wondered about that. Might they experiment with, and I think they did a little bit of that, but it was experimenting with different playing groups and that kind of thing. But I do think that both coaches coached it to win and the players certainly played it to win because that game got chippy. It got hot with guys going at it, technicals being <laughs> assessed yeah. to people um, physical confrontations. I mean, that was everything you would want from a high level game between two teams that could compete for a national title. And um, so in that respect, it was, it was really, really good to see. Yeah. There's no question. And you know that the game in many ways came, I guess they all have different twists and turns, but I mean, the game opened up with Michigan state basically spotting Tennessee, 18 points. I mean, going down 19 to one, I feel like the first five or six possessions, I think Michigan State had one shot attempt. They kept uh, throwing the That's ball correct. away and I mean turnovers. It it was sloppy. They looked kind of sleepy. I felt like they they didn't come out with a lot of intensity initially, and then they got a little frustrated. And you know Tennessee got rolling a little bit, and you know never really slowed down. It wasn't really until Malik Hall picked it up the team midway through the first half, and really took over for a couple of possessions where they kind of woke up and they got it down to three at halftime. And I think I was feeling pretty good about the game. And then Tennessee, to their credit, I mean, they just kind of, they did just enough throughout the second half to stay up five, eight, ten points, and then to get down to five again. And it wasn't until, you know, AJ hit that three to tie it. And then that weird call down the, you know, it was a, it was a foul, but it's like one that doesn't usually get called. No, no, was not a foul. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm was not a foul. There was, it did not look like there was any contact made. I'm sure you couldn't see. I it couldn't. Live. Yeah, I wasn't paying yeah, much attention. Is, to be honest, we'll get, we'll get into that. Finish, finish your thought, and then we'll get into. All no, of I just, that. I think you know, I got, I got a lot of thoughts. right. <laughs> I, I think uh, the the game was. You said it was a very good game. It was a lively crowd, but it was, it was just that gigantic hole that we should say dug in the first half, and yeah. and uh, and the thing that surprised me about the Michigan State was able to score a lot of points. I mean, they scored 88 points on it. And really, seventy-eight of them in the in thirty minutes, <laughs> because they had almost no points through through about ten the ten minute mark halfway through the first half. I think they were barely on, they're on pace to like hit forty, so they really turned it on. And I don't feel like they ever. I never felt like Michigan State went on gigantic runs where they just were you know scoring 10, 12 point runs, and yet they just kind of chipped away and they scored a lot. I it was it was an it was an impressive, unimpressive uh, performance offensively from them. I, if that makes any sense, I just they, they nothing was like stood out to me a ton like great shooting or something like that well okay uh, prove me wrong there's a lot of ground there's a lot, <laughs> there's of a lot there to cover here the, the first thing is very clearly michigan state was not ready to play a team playing as hard as tennis yeah um that's what it was in those first that five six minute flurry to start the game tennessee came out of the box 
and imposed their will. When I talk about them playing like an old style Big Ten team, that's that's what it was. And Michigan State got punched in the mouth repeatedly and didn't respond early. Now, they responded over the course of the game, which I think is right. something that you can look at as a positive. They got their way back in it. They never went away. Uh, you're absolutely right about Tennessee in the second half. Just every time, and they talked about it on the broadcast um, repeatedly. Um, Raf talked about it. Izzo talked about it because you may not know they had both coaches mic'd up. And so they were talking during the game separately and then together on a couple of occasions. And um, Izzo said it too, that he said, every time it seemed like we were there ready to make a run um, and, and push Tennessee would make a play. Yeah. They would answer a lot of it coming from connect who was just phenomenal. He was great in this game. I, I was, you know, generally familiar with his game, with, with what he did um, last season. He was very highly regarded as a transfer, so not a surprise that he came out and played well. But uh, what was surprising was his overall floor game. Um, I didn't realize he was that good a ball handler. The, the play he made, which, again, watching it live, I'm not sure how apparent it was, but he had a play in transition where Trey Holloman was setting him up to strip him, and he went behind the back, elevated for a dunk that I would have thought the only guy on that floor who could make that play was Cohen Carr, <laughs> and drew the foul on Malik Hall. It was incredibly impressive, the whole thing, in all in combination. The avoiding the strip, going behind his back, and then finishing the way he finished. That kid was... I mean, that was an all-American level performance. Michigan State had no answer for him. And so that you got to give credit to Tennessee. Every time Michigan State pushed, somebody for them stepped up. Oftentimes it was him in just a great individual game. He had 29 points. Yeah. And it was just, they, like I say, they just did not have an answer. So um, there was that. The officiating was awful, not just on the last <laughs> call, but all day. Yeah. And both coaches, you know, laughingly, but seriously referred to it. I'm not saying it decided the game, although the, the last call led to the deciding point. So you can accurately say that, but in general, they missed calls both ways. I thought there was a lot of contact that they would call. Yep. And then a very similar play the next time down at the other end would get, yeah, would get missed. I agree. You know, it was just a lot of that, um, just a lot of missed botched calls. And the last one, now I'm going to say this, I didn't get to see that the broadcast team did not have the opposite angle. So I should, I guess I should hesitate from saying definitively that they blew it, but I'm pretty sure they did because they replayed it twice. What happened on that last call was, um, Tennessee is going up the sideline. And Trey Holloman is over there on, was it, uh, was, who was it? Was it Ganey? I think it was Ganey, number think? two. Yeah, Ganey, yeah. Ganey, yeah, on Ganey, okay? And it looked like Trey was getting ready to body him. But I don't think Trey ever touched him. The, there was not contact. So the kid kind of went around him. And by the way, traveled. Because he didn't have contact. Now, the call was made that there was contact. And so, okay, that's a foul. It negates the travel. But the reality is not only was there not a foul in my view, but there was a walk, which would have given the ball back to Michigan State with whatever there was, yeah. 1.9 seconds left at half court. Um, a better chance to maybe get up an, another miracle shot. Um, so my thought is, as much as these two teams have things to work on, the officials definitely have things to work on because that was a poorly officiated game. They called, I think it was something like 54, 56 fouls. 54 fouls, yeah. Between the yeah. two teams. Yeah, come on. I know they're two very physical teams. I get it. Come on. Yeah, I mean, Malik you know, was on the free just, throw line the entire second half, I felt like. Yeah, and then, and then on top of that, you know, I, I think about 
the ones that they missed too. It could have been even worse. So um not very happy with that. And again, not not such a big deal in terms of deciding a game, although again, when the deciding point comes from a call like that, they did in fact decide it. Uh, but that was a bad call. Uh, the, my, the only way I'll take that back is if somebody has another angle that shows definitively Trey Holloman actually touched it. Because it, Trey, you see Trey kind of contort his body to avoid him. And that is, in fact, what I think he did. So anyway, um, un- really unfortunate <laughs> because Michigan State made an unbelievable defensive play and then A.J. Hogard with just a money three to tie it right before that yeah which took all the joy away from msu making a great play you know that was really really unfortunate so um tough tough outcome there but on the other hand you look at it and you say well michigan state had that just terrible start where they were not ready to play and were not responding and you know, weren't able to stop Tennessee because I do think it was defensively where that game was really lost. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I give Tennessee great credit for making the shots, but I don't think Michigan State's defense was very good today. For as happy as we were with what they what they showed against Hillsdale, you saw some issues, especially in dribble containment. Izzo talked about it during the broadcast. He just felt they didn't do a good enough job in uh dribble denial and i think that's true because a lot of the ten a lot of the threes that tennessee got were of the drive and kick variety and that happened because a guy got beat and then help had to come yeah which leaves an open shooter and they made shots so that's not what michigan state wants to do it's not what their players should be doing because we know they're capable of doing much better. You know, there, there were some things as I'm, I'm trying to think of all the things as I mentioned, one of the things he mentioned, which I think was true and showed up in this game and why I mentioned Tennessee size. He talked about how he felt, and this came right after, I don't know if you recall, there was a segment where Tyson Walker hits a three. I think he might've gotten the game back to one or two. It was anyway, it was a, it seemed like a big shot. Tennessee came right down and um, went to, and I'm forgetting which guy it was. Um, let me say, I think it might've been uh, Mashak. Uh, one of their guards who just backed Tyson down very patiently and ends up getting about a five foot uh, turnaround bank shot to go. Cause he just worked. Yeah. Him. Right. And as Izzo said, he said, you know, Look, they took advantage of that. We haven't yet put in all of our stuff defensively in terms of what we're going to do. Like, for example, in a in a game a little later in the season, he mentioned you'd probably see them bring, bring help Yeah, in those situations. <laughs> they didn't do that today, and Tennessee took advantage. That's where Tennessee had a physical advantage, and MSU just couldn't counter. Um, but... You know, I think I think my overall, we'll, obviously, we'll get into more of the, the micro here, but my macro level thought is disappointing the way a veteran team came out and was just not prepared for the start of that game mentally. They just were not where they needed to be playing an opponent like that, but very encouraged by the way they kept coming, kept coming, kept coming, never let up, never let it get away because God knows there were points they could have chosen to fold. Sure and didn't and and there were some things that we wanted to see and we'll get into this as we we talk about it further there were some things that we wanted to see that we did in fact see in this game offensive rebounding mm-hmm. being a big one um the continued effect of their pressure defense playing fast you mentioned the number of points that were scored pretty remarkable i did not see that coming because that's that the sum of that is down to Tennessee choosing to play faster too. And it's because they've got some guys that are better suited to playing that way now mm-hmm. than maybe what they had last year. But uh I still think those are all things that Michigan State can build on. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, a lot of those points too came off free throws. I mean, both teams hit twenty six free throws, so out of thirty six tries. Yeah. So uh you can 
obviously you score a lot without your time coming off the clock. Um, uh, so I, true, but they, you know, uh, some of some of it again, and and the officials doing <laughs> the job they did or didn't do, but um, certainly some of that uh, free throw activity for both teams was as a result of aggressive offense that forced the defense to foul them. So I still give them credit for that. Sure. Uh, so if we want to start, I guess, with our brothers to just gutters player, they wanted the Michigan state want to keep in the gutter. Josiah Jordan James actually did a pretty good job. He played 30 minutes. He was only two for three from the field with eight points, three rebounds. He didn't actually have much of an impact. He just turned the ball over three times, had a couple steals. Uh, and so they did a good job of containing him. Uh, and so, you know, if it's important to you to contain that water on your roof, make sure you call the brothers at Just Two Gutters. Uh, they can keep that stuff away from the side of your house, which then gets to your basement and causes all kinds of problems, your foundation or leaky through your walls. Uh, no one wants a flooded basement where you have to, your sump pump has to work extra hard. So make sure you contact the brothers at Just Two Gutters to take care of all that rain, ice, snow, all the kind of stuff that comes off your roof. You want to keep it away from your house. They do fantastic work. They're fully insured. They work in just about any weather. They're pretty amazing. And uh, obviously well-priced too is if you need it repaired, replaced, or just cleaned out, maybe you just need some leaf guards. And I have my leaf guards and I've been just looking at all the people clean out their gutters and it's not me. So I'm very happy. I had to clean out my foster son's gutters and I'm like, oh, this is why we got leaf guards. Uh, so call the Brothers Gutters at brothersgutters.com. You can find the contact information in the podcast player or at the episode page on our website. Uh, so again, I think they did a good job containing him. It's just what we did not expect is that uh, the two transfers connected and Ganey would be so impactful with 28 and 28 yeah. points each. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was really it, that um, those guys just stepped forward and were very aggressive and very, very efficient. Um, you know, Ganey early yeah. got red hot during that early run from three. And then from there it was connect just took over and, they tried, I mean, MSU had everybody guarding that guy, and it just didn't matter. I feel like the one difference in Michigan State's defense, and and I don't know if this is, it, it seemed to me that they were sort of over over hedging the passes passes and things to, and and that would give these, uh, would give the Tennessee players opportunity to drive the lane. So they weren't, you know, they were, they were kind of playing almost too tight in some ways, I felt like. And Izzo mentioned he was not happy with the way the bigs were playing ball screens. So I think that's probably what you saw. And then you see all the help and it gets it just, it's discombobulated once you get down, you know, people yeah. racing around yeah. and the fouls too, which is a natural result of people being out of position. It, it was not a great game for MSU's bigs. Uh, they, they had some, some early moments offensively, you know, both uh, Mahdi and Carson uh, each hit a nice post move early on when MSU was just desperate for any kind of offense and then, then they just kind of didn't do very much, and they continued to have some defensive issues. So uh, that's something they'll be looking to clean up for sure. Well, let's go over our keys of the game uh, brought to you by Nudge Printing. Nudge Printing is a great way to get your Spartan gear and apparel. Uh, nudgeprinting.com. Gabe and Brittany are great Spartan alums. They have a production facility here in Michigan and Portland. And so it's all Michigan crafted, screen printed, Fantastic, breathable, wearable. Um, I've got a bunch of shirts and sweatshirts, and they're all super comfortable. They last multiple washings. They really do a fantastic job. They're the favorites of all my family members. <laughs> Actually, I have to get more because they're like, we want more other things. So uh, you can't go wrong. You can check out their large selection, both of vintage and current uh, Spartan uh, logos. I guess it like, like lots of the gruff Sparty. You can get that at nudgeprinting.com. Final Four is a coupon code at checkout to get 20% off your order. Uh, that's Final Four just with as one word. So the first key of the game was health. And I think, you know, in that sense, it worked. It went great. Everybody stayed healthy, and at least as far as we could tell. Yep. That's the biggest thing is that nobody got hurt. Uh, and, and that's ultimately what you want coming out of this, regardless of the result. Yeah, it was the game that felt like an exhibition game, but didn't feel like an exhibition game, right? There were times you're like, yeah, they don't really care. Uh, and but it definitely felt like super competitive. But I don't th- except the like, guys with nine they... fouls playing. I mean that was the kind of the weird thing about the game. Well, that's true. That's true. You can point to that, but but you can. I think what you can say is that made it in some ways even more competitive because um, 
those guys weren't penalized right. for that in terms of not being able to play. And, you know, it, it also led to, I think it, it, it meant that the physicality was not something they were quite as cautious about as they would have been under normal circumstances. Yeah, no question. Yeah. But I, I felt that was a game that both teams absolutely played to win, and I think it was coached that way too. That, that was the great thing about the way that it went at the end. Both sides can can now put that in the memory bank that they've already, these groups have already been in a game that went down to the wire. And so they had to deal with all that stuff. They had to deal with, you know, making free throws or not making them. Yep. Um, they deal with handling inbounds or how you deny inbounds in those situations, making big shots, being smart with the basketball when it matters, you know, all of those things they've, they've now experienced that. So that's a big deal both ways. I think they're both going to be happy about that. Yeah, certainly for Tennessee. I mean, high pressure situation, hostile crowd, and you're able to just hang on and just do just enough to win. I mean, that's gotta be, uh, Rick Barnes gotta be super happy about that, especially with his point guard who was still uh didn't end up playing because he was recovering from the acl yep. injury so uh, they have to be very pleased uh so the second key to the game was the pace and, and our expectation was is that tennessee played slow last year they play slow this year and that michigan state would have to would probably not be able to play very fast well i mean both teams scored almost 90 points so pace was not an issue uh 27 to 22 fast break edge for michigan state according to our stats which felt about yep. right i think you know when yep yep I think, um, especially with Ziegler unable to play, which we, we weren't certain whether he'd play or not. It ended up that he didn't play. Um, I was surprised, but, but now having seen Tennessee, I don't see any reason why they would look to play an ultra slow pace the way they did a year ago. Um, that's a team that I think has plenty of horsepower athletically, um, it looks like they've got better shooting. I think that seems to be a group that should be able to play effectively by playing fast. So I don't see any reason why they shouldn't continue to do that. I mean, it'll be interesting to monitor them through the course of the year. Um, but for Michigan State, look, I mean, that's a big deal. You know, this is this is two exhibitions that we've seen them able to get into transition a fair amount to push pace, you know, and, and it'll, of course, there'll be different challenges on that front when they get into conference play and they're facing a lot of teams who don't want to play that way, but, um, so far so good. And, and I will say, I will say this following on the backs of the Hillsdale game where we talked about how, yeah, that was a more aggressive defensive approach than we're used to seeing. Mm -hmm from Michigan state, you know, still staying gap sound, not, not, uh, certainly not trapping, not extending too much in terms of, you know, gambling for steals and passing lanes and that type of thing. But, but more of it than we have gotten used to seeing, well, here's another example. The, uh, Tennessee had, what did they have? 20 turnovers, the 19 turnovers, right? I think. And yeah, 19 turnovers, 12 of them were MSU. Steals. No, you're right. 20. Yeah. 12. Steals. I was going to mention that too. The so fast hands, which steals. contributes to that pace of play that you can get more fast breaks. And, the, yeah. and they were, yeah. And those steals were earned. I mean, Michigan state right down to that last possession where Tennessee inbounds, I think they were trying to inbound to James and, um, it was uh, Jeremy Fears kind of behind him, got his hand on the ball, sort of knocked it loose. Then Tyson Walker got on the floor, came up with it, kicked it out, and the ball got swung around to Hogard for the three that tied it, um, which, by the way, was the first time the game had even been tied <laughs> since it was 0-0. I know, yeah. It took Michigan State 59 minutes and, <laughs> you know, for whatever, 59 minutes, let's say, yeah. to do that. Uh, but I, I think that's also encouraging in terms of what may happen with pace of play, because this team, that's, that's something that Michigan state teams typically don't do. And again, as I said, a, a while back, there were some defensive issues here, the way the ball screens were played. Um, I think in general, the way they handled uh, guard penetration was not great, but I think there was still 
some things to like, and that was one of them. That they were they were really aggressive in forcing Tennessee to give the ball up. Yeah, and I think you know when you look at points of the paint, and if you you know Michigan State does not have a huge post presence in the sense that. Uh, you know, not dumping the ball into Nick Ward or someone like that. And they, they won the points of the paint 30 to 22. And that was at yeah. least in part from, you know, working off of turnovers and scoring um, sure. you know, the steals. Uh, so the third key to the game, and one that I think surprised me during the game is the is rebounding. I, Michigan State, with a pretty, pretty decisive rebounding edge, 38 to 31, especially considering that they were shooting – worse than Tennessee. So there'd be much more opportunities for defensive rebounds for Tennessee. Uh, Michigan state uh, held Tennessee to just uh, to just uh, eight offensive rebounds, which was 32% of a rebounding rate, which is still pretty good for Tennessee, but Michigan state had 16. Well, let's, let's hold on for okay. a second though. Let's remember Tennessee was number six in the country right. in offensive rebounding rate last year. So, I'm not going to say it was brilliant defensive rebounding by Michigan State, but it was it was solid. It was decent. It, it didn't feel like it resulted in that many dis, that many you know well, it's only eight extra shots for Tennessee, yep. um, and then yet Michigan State in contrast 16 offensive rebounds for 46 yeah. percent uh, offensive rebounding rate off misses, uh, fantastic. And you know that is uh, in large part to uh, Malik Hall had a lot of them. He had four. Uh, Sissoko had three offensive rebounds, Carr and Cooper each with two. Uh, so, I mean, there's everybody chipped in uh, with the offensive rebounding. So that was very encouraging. I mean, that clearly that was a point of emphasis after the Hillsdale game that they got after it on both ends of the court. And uh, anyway, that hopefully that's more of what we see this season. And that was against, obviously, against a much better rebounding team than Hillsdale. Absolutely. I mean, for a team that's as big as Tennessee is and, and plays as hard with as much physicality as they do and, and which prioritizes rebounding the way they do, that was a very encouraging thing to see, to see Michigan State being capable of stepping up. Uh, the offensive rebounding especially, really impressive. And, and you know, that's one of the things I've said this. Um you know, Malik Hall, Joey Hauser, yeah, there are definitely some things you're giving up. Malik's not the shooter that Joey was. Um, might not be the defensive rebounder that Joey was, but there are certain things that Malik gives you that Joey didn't. And one of them, I believe, could be offensive rebounding. And today, to see him get four against that opponent, that was really good. Um, it needs to continue, you know. They just, they need to keep, they need to keep, uh, keep showing steady improvement on that end, get back to Michigan State basketball. But honestly, for all the issues, and there were some, as we've talked about, um, if you want to see Michigan State get back to being Michigan State, you got it in this game. They, they really worked the offensive glass. They ran a lot. They were in transition a lot. And they played with some physicality and some toughness once they got past that first five or six minute flurry. Yeah, right. Yeah, they kind of. Um, those, so those yeah. are all encouraging signs. Uh, the fourth key to the game is rotations. And this is more not a well, it was more just to kind of see what what the rotation pattern would be like. Um, yeah. And I think we saw a little bit more of what we could expect this season. I think Cooper's the first one off the bench to replace Mati. Now, at that time, I still thought it was like a regular five fouls. <laughs> Because I think Mati had picked up two quick fouls, on, he did, and it was yeah. kind of the second was kind of weird, but um, that was I guess went for m much of the game. It turned out in the end, but uh, so I think the rotations were just what they were, uh, and I still think the one nice thing is when the freshmen come in, they inject quite a bit of energy and also a decent amount of like skill and different sort of. I mean, obviously bring Car off, but even Fears, uh, they're gonna they're gonna be pushing these these upperclassmen all season, which is nice because it. It gives is a lot of a lot more options than he's had most of the time. I think well, I think there were some interesting things that came out of this game from a rotation standpoint. And look, we're not going to know for sure until the games. But, you know, I until the Duke think, game probably really. Yeah, exactly. I think they played this one basically the way they would play a regular season game. That's what it felt like to me. But we don't know for sure. That said, Cohen Carr saw more minutes at the four in this game. If, if you look at how that went, yeah. Booker only played, played eight. sparingly. Yeah, eight minutes. Didn't play a lot of minutes. 
Yeah, and and didn't get in until we were fair. You know, Carr had already been in the game and come back out before Booker got in. I thought actually Booker was like suspended or something for the game because he, I mean, he was. I almost feel a car came in twice before Booker came in in once. I might have. Yeah, it was like have. late in the first half. But but I think that says something. And look, if, if you look at the way Cohen Carr played, <laughs> you understand why. I mean, that that is he he and Jeremy Fears both look incredibly comfortable in terms of uh being ready to play right now. And I, I still happen to think Xavier Booker, you know, he hit a three in this game. I think he might've blocked a shot. Yep. Um, he's going to be able to contribute. So I, I don't think there's much of a, um, my, I don't have uh, questions about that. I think he's going to play and he's going to continue to get chances. And the hope is that gradually over time, He's just going to get better and better and more consistently able to impact games. But Cohen Carr can do it right now. He he does not look out of place in the oh slightest. My goodness. I mean, once again, we saw a, an off-the-dribble move ending in just a ferocious dunk. Where I just, you know, you get surprised by I, it. I couldn't believe that happened, that least. first one. I, it, I do it at least because it doesn't appear, you know, we as, as fans – and if you played the game or whether you watched it long enough, whatever it is, you know, you can sense when certain plays are coming Yeah, as you're watching them unfold, right? Yeah. And Cohen Carr on that play, it didn't feel like that was coming. No. And the reason that it came was basically down to the fact that he's a freak. <laughs> and so, and they said this on the broadcast and it's absolutely true. Most guys, that play ends in a finger roll at the rim. Cohen Carr has his head over the rim. <laughs> That's the difference. Yeah. Um, so pretty uh pretty impressive stuff. But I thought that was interesting. I think that and Izzo said this, they they had the cameras in the locker room at halftime, and he made the comment that they got back you would mention Malik Hall, and I know the baskets you were talking about, but I tended to agree with Izzo that what turned it was started at least with Trey Holloman defending. Yep. That's true. And forcing some turnovers and, and, you know, limiting some guys. Whereas, you know, prior to that, Tennessee had just been rolling offensively. And, and I think the, the Trey Holloman, Jeremy fears combination is, is one that I, I was interested to see how they're using them. And, and look, there's there's no hesitation in going to those guys. That much is blatantly obvious to me right now. Like they are they are ready to utilize them freely as they need to. And and so that's interesting. Um so we'll see uh we'll see as the next, you know, few games unfold, we get into the regular season how the minutes look and how things, you know, how the substitution patterns unfold. But right now it feels to me like they're willing to go with more or less any combination of those five guys. Yeah. You know, and there's not a lot of hesitation like, Oh, we can't play this guy with that one. It, it doesn't feel that way. Yeah. Well, we talked about this before. They have so many players who can move well, well enough that you can switch all over the place and, and, I mean, occasionally, like we, you mentioned, that Walker ended up, you know, guarding their guard, their center, <laughs> and so that was a problem. But for the most part, you can have so much switching out there that you're not really limited too much in your in your uh, substitution pattern. You know, if there's some people, some person has fouls and stuff, you can play car at the three. And I mean, they had the end; they were playing five guards, which I know they're trying to get steals and stuff. But um, I, they just have a lot of there's just a lot of options for Izzo. At, the funny thing is, we we're sitting probably about halfway through the. Well, maybe it's halftime. My wife turns to me. She said, I really like that fierce kid. <laughs> I really like him a lot. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Rod likes him a lot, too. <laughs> because- yeah, he. I thought I thought he stepped up, and I thought he played. I thought he played a really nice game. Again, especially defensively, he had some moments. Yep. And Trey as well, where where they really, you know, they, they made it happen. And uh, that's good to see. You know, they're going to they're gonna need, they're definitely going to need that kind of that kind of play out of those guys. I mean, neither one of them put up huge stat lines. They each had what two points apiece. Yeah. But um 
but still uh, some some very impressive stuff from those They're guys. They're impactful minutes, even though, and like you mentioned on the defensive end. Um, yep. And the fifth key to the game was toughness. I think, you know, outside of the first five, whatever, six minutes of the game, where Michigan State just kind of was kind of shell-shocked. They, I think they matched Tennessee with the toughness. Um, you maybe could say, uh, I felt like Cooper had struggled a little bit out there with maybe the physicality and maybe even, um, and Booker, but Booker just seemed kind of maybe lost, if anything, if at most. But other than that, I think everybody else handled things fine. I mean, they were fighting like crazy. Well, that's why they out, had more offensive rebounds. I mean, just, you know, everybody was going after it. Yeah, I, you know, the, 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 the opening flurry to the game is going to be very disappointing to everybody. They're going to look back at that and say, man, if we'd even had a halfway normal <laughs> response yeah. to that, this game probably is one where you win by a couple possessions, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so that's deeply disappointing but in your own gym, you know, but I think that the way they responded to that, the way they responded to that adversity is the part that you can come away from this game feeling very good about, you know, yep. they didn't fold their tent. They kept coming. They, they found a way to match Tennessee's physicality. As you say, you don't rack up. 16 offensive rebounds against that team and and limit them pretty effectively at the other end without without bringing it yeah physically you know and so all of that i think is a very positive thing that you can take away from this game it's just tempered a bit by the fact that they just didn't I never in my wildest dreams did i think they were capable of coming out with a start like that you know, where they just clearly were not ready for the opponent, for the effort and the energy and the toughness that the opponent was bringing. So that was disappointing. Yeah. But but how fortunate is it that that happens as an exhibition game? It doesn't count for anything. And sure. you get, and so not only do you get sort of, you know, punch in the face, you're like, wow, we got to We got to bring it even when we, you know, when we're at home, because I think that sometimes you can assume it's going to be a little bit easier at home. Uh, but also, uh, you know, just recognizing that you're going to be you you can you can still recover uh, but that you're also i think very helpful for them is that they are not um that they may be top 5 but you've got to play top 5 basketball in order to do that and that's always you know a tough thing with those college kids that you have to you have to bring in i thought you know even i think even walker and hogard who you expect to be really consistent they they really struggled initially too and it what took a while for them that's to get going that's what i'm talking yeah, about I that's that's the that's the disappointing sure. thing is it wasn't fears and yeah, Holloman right. and, and Carr where you're like, okay, they're, they're kids who just, you know, aren't quite ready yet, have never experienced those moments. Those guys actually acquitted themselves pretty well throughout, I felt, yep. in that regard. Um, it was the veterans, just guys that should not have that problem. And so, you know, at this stage, you just, you chalk it up to being one of those things and, you know, you hope that uh you hope that they learn from it as you said and that we see a we see a different different outcome as the game start to count but um i would definitely think it's going to be a teaching moment and a tool that is <laughs> looks to use without a doubt and i think you know overall the biggest concern i think both of us had coming into this game is the rebounding and uh what was gonna what it looked like and i think that looks like it's well, I shouldn't say it's not a problem, but it's certainly something that they can they can solve. And so that was well, it, shows, it shows you that the potential is right. Exactly. And so that and when, that's when like the big hole, that, right? Yeah. When you can do that against that opponent. OK, you've done it against a team that is probably as good on the glass as anybody they're going to see in the Big Ten. Yeah. You know, so that means there's no there's no excuse. And and, and I think that that's. You know, there, there's there's something to be said, I think, and I, we've touched on this before. I think that is an area that Cohen Carr and Xavier Booker can potentially be very big difference makers in. Mm -hmm. I think that's true now, but I think, at least my hope is, that by March, it's a really big difference. Because those guys have physical tools that 
they're they're awfully tough to compete with. You know, Cohen Carr can do some things that nobody else on the floor can do. Xavier Booker, because of his physical tools, can do some things that nobody else on the floor can do. And so offensive rebounding is an area where I think those guys could really be difference makers potentially. So uh, I guess that's pretty much it. I think, you know, from a shooting standpoint, Michigan State shot pretty well uh, from three, although they weren't good early. They they uh, picked it up at the end, I think, where they end up shooting 40%, over well, 40% from three. So the only, the, only, um, the only issue is they didn't get up a lot of attempts. They were only eight for eight for 17. Right. Now, you know, give, give Tennessee some credit for that because I thought Tennessee played a, a pretty good defensive game in that regard. You know, I don't think that's the thing. Part of the reason that I felt like it was a very good game is neither team after those first few minutes where Tennessee pretty much did what they wanted after that, I don't think either team generally got a ton of things easy. Yeah. They weren't comfortable, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so that's, that's encouraging. It also says something about the talent level on both teams that they've got guys who can find their way to scoring plays, even when it's not coming easy. So um, for MSU, that would be the one, the one issue would be uh, that they didn't, they didn't get up more attempts, but again, give some credit to Tennessee. I think um, free throw shooting, you know, it's easy to come at Michigan State. Uh, Tyson Walker, the last guy, <laughs> yeah, the first those. guy you'd want there, the last guy you think would have a problem, it, that really hurt at a big moment, uh, missed two. Right. Um, but, you know, but Tennessee had their own problems. The two teams were dead even. <laughs> yeah. In free throws exactly made, free throws attempted, all of it. Yeah. So that wasn't a deciding factor in the end. And in fact, Tennessee missed the first of those two shots they were gifted with at the end. Um, and you know, took it right down to the wire where they needed to make that free throw to end it. Um, you know, so I, I think for Michigan State, after they had struggled against Hillsdale from the line. You know, 72% as a team is not, it's not fantastic, but it's tolerable. So I think they bounced back decently. Not that I was particularly worried about it. I, I didn't have uh, any thoughts that this is not going to be a good free throw shooting team. I think it will be. Um, although I, I will say Carson Cooper is one guy that really does need to pick it up because if he's going to play as big a role as many minutes as I think he will because of the position he plays and the nature of his game, you know, cause he is, a, I think has shown the potential to be a good offensive rebounder. Yeah. He's going to be around the basket and he's going to get fouled. He's got to be able to cash in at an acceptable rate. He was three for five you know, for the so game, just, but it did not feel like he it was, was three for five. <laughs> I think cause he hadn't hit the first. Early. Yeah. Hillsdale, he missed, he missed almost all. Early. And then he missed the first couple. Yeah. yeah right. So, it, um, so, that that's fine. You know, 60% from him is okay-ish. Yeah. Um, you'd like it to be better, but it's at least tolerable, but you can't have like one for fives. That's just, that's just death. So um, that would be one thing I would watch. But other than that, I think Michigan State's going to be just fine from the line. I think they're going to be just fine from three as they were again on a percentage basis today. Um you know, as it's, it's it's a weird thing because you look at a lot of the numbers and there are a lot of things to like yeah, yeah. in that performance that really were, despite the start. But you just come away from it feeling a little bit frustrated because um, that is a game that I think Michigan State just just needed. Well, they they needed to not have that start, and then from there. They just needed to make a couple of plays. Yeah. You know, and and credit to Tennessee every time they needed to make a play, it seemed like they came up with it. Michigan State just not able to make that one big decisive play that, that might have gotten them over the hump at either end. The last thing I'll ask you is about Malik Hall uh, with his three. I mean, I felt like he had a couple opportunities to shoot some threes. 
and passed yep. them up and then drove into yep. traffic. And I don't know if that many of them yep. turned out very well. Like they, like they oftentimes don't, <laughs> you know, a couple of spin moves and then maybe it goes in, but it's oftentimes like a crazy sort of usually a turnover. Um, do you, do you think he just doesn't trust his shot right now? Because it certainly seemed like he had enough w- of a window to get a couple of those off. Well, he had a big one that Izzo commented on fairly yeah, late, late in the game. game. Yeah, that was for sure. He had an open three. He passed up and stayed inside, drive to the hoop. Should have been a foul call. There wasn't, but he ends up missing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's noticeable. And they can't afford that. And I have a feeling, and it, the fact that Izzo mentioned it, says to me, well, that's going to be a talking point. Malik's going to hear about that and say, look, man, you're that open. you got to pull the trigger. We need you to be a shooter. And if he misses, so be it. But he's got to he's got to be willing to take the shot, you know. Um, and uh, I would like to think that will happen, but that is worth commenting on. Uh, I thought he did a lot of good things in this game. Yeah, I mean, the, you mentioned sure. the four offensive rebounds. He had a couple of really nice post moves, mm-hmm. and that's, you know, it's interesting. We didn't talk about this, but, you know, I, I've come into this season pretty much accepting that they're not going to have a very productive low post game because I, I just don't expect Mahdi to develop consistency there at this stage. I think Cooper maybe is still not at a spot, you know, where you expect it from him on a consistent basis. Kohler, the one guy you think might be able to do it, is, of course, out of the lineup. Um, But they did some interesting things in this game, and I thought they manufactured some stuff. Malik Hall was part of that, and then Cooper and and Mahdi each had one really nice post move for baskets. They didn't go back to it very much, in part because they they got down so big so early that I think it maybe took them out of some things offensively that they might have otherwise opted to do. But um, that was encouraging, too. I've, I've felt for years that Malik Hall has it in him to be an effective post player, say, the way that Aaron Henry was, you know, yeah. and that's and that's something this team could really use. You know, the, the points in the paint were good. That stat was good for Michigan State today. But uh, I don't know if, if they can. If that's if that's not a mirage, if they actually are going to be able to get some decent production out of those guys, that's a big positive for Michigan State. That could really make a, a difference for them offensively. Well, anything else? Otherwise, we'll get out of here and we'll come back with a preview for the next game, I suppose, which is November 6th. So it'll be sometime early November. We'll get back to you with the pregame for the James Madison home opener. Uh, we are now like eight days away, I think, from that for the opening game. So, um, I don't do any parting words, or should we head on out? Oh, uh, uh, disappointing end, but I think there's some things to be encouraged by, and uh, you know, we'll get ready for the lights to come on for real. Yeah, I think it's nothing to be too super concerned about. I, there's nothing. There's no, no huge alarm no. bells going or like real. That's a good team things, right? too. Uh, one other thing worth emphasizing if that's if that's the way that Tennessee team can play they're going to be in it every bit as much as Michigan State is for a final four and a national title and that they were very very good yeah and and so maybe in some surprising ways like the way they shot um so uh, that that's also worth keeping in mind Okay, well, I just want to remind you that if you have not yet entered in the Beat Rod contest, we do have opportunities to win Nudge Printing uh, Spartan gear. Uh, you can head on over to Nudge Printing by your own stuff, or you can email me, Eric, E-R-I-C, at TFFINOTS.com. Give me your selection, how the final Big Ten rankings will be, 1 through 14. Uh, obviously, leave your name, and then the amount of points Michigan State scores against Michigan this season, they play them twice, will be the tiebreaker. Uh, we'll use the tie-breaking for the standings, uh, what they use for the for the standings for the Big Ten tournament seating. Uh, so send those in. They have to be in before the first Big Ten game, which is the first week of December. So you've got a, you've got a good month. 
you have an opportunity to listen to all the previews if you had not caught all of them, and also to watch a couple of the Big Ten teams play to get a better feel for it because you know Rod's going in cold, so you at least have that on him. Uh, so again, get that in before you can, and if you've not yet subscribed to the show, please be sure to do so and leave a written review. It helps drive all that traffic to our show. So until next time, the final four is on the schedule. Go green. <laughs> Thank you.